Okay, can everyone hear me? Cool? Not too loud. Okay, kia ora everyone. My name is Josh. Uh, I'm one of the lecturers in the Department of Chemical and Materials Engineering. Um, but I also did my undergraduate here. And one of the things that I really enjoyed when I was an undergraduate was material science. So I'm really excited to tell you guys a bit more about what material science is. So one of the things that I find really cool about material science is you guys kind of already know a little bit about materials. So say this morning you go to have your breakfast before you come here, you open your box of cornflakes, inside there's a plastic bag. So plastic bags are what we call polymers. So polymers are one of the types of materials that we study. You take your cornflakes, you pour them into a bowl. Those bowls are usually ceramics, another type of material. And then you dig into them with a spoon. Spoons usually made out of metal. So if I was to ask you some questions about those materials, you'd probably know a little bit about them. So if you take your spoon and you try and bend it, probably bend, right? If you try and take your bowl and you try and bend it, probably not. So we can already see that ceramics and metals have different properties. So why is that? So that is why we study these materials. That's what material science is all about. So the different properties of these materials comes down to their structure. So right down on the atomic level, how these materials are put together affects their properties. And as materials engineers, what we're really good at doing is processing materials in certain ways to get the structure that we desire to get the properties that we desire. Okay, so let's have a look at a few examples. So metals. So we know that some metals are magnetic, others are not. Why is that? So if we look at the way that atoms are arranged in a metal, they have these simple arrangements called cubic cells. So we can kind of simplify them down to these very basic arrangements of atoms. The one on the left has magnetic properties, the one on the right does not. Okay? So a very, very simple change in the structure, the way that atoms are arranged, changes one of its properties. So here I have two pieces of steel. They're pretty much the same. Okay? Each of these pieces of steel contains some iron atoms and some carbon atoms. So each one has approximately 1.2 times 10 to the 24 iron atoms. That is this many zeros. Okay, I did the calculations. And a little bit less carbon atoms. Okay, so they're basically the same. But what I have done is I have processed them differently. Can I get two volunteers from the audience? Does anyone want to volunteer? One. Let me get someone else. Two. <laughs> There's both enthusiastic hand wave. Come on down. So, one pair of safety glasses for you. One pair of, actually, can we swap those around? Wait. These ones work over glasses. Okay, so, here's your pieces of steel. You want to compare them? They look identical? Mostly the same? Everyone's in agreement? Cool, cool. Okay, so, what we're going to do is we're going to test their material properties. So, in a very scientific methodology, we're going to hit them with a hammer. So, here you go. Start off slowly, just tap it, and kind of increase the amount of energy that you're putting in. Okay. Someone's been working out. Number two. There you go. Okay. Same thing. Are you okay? That you, should she take over? <laughs> keep going, keep going. <laughs> Almost there. There you go, just whack it that way, whack it that way. Yeah, that's good enough. Okay, so, obviously different, right? Same pieces of steel. There you go, that's yours. Same amount of carbon atoms, same amount of iron atoms, but they have different mechanical properties. Thank you very much. Round of applause. So, what did I do? How did I change that so that they reacted so differently? 
So what I did is I took both pieces of steel, I put them in the furnace 850 degrees. I took one out, put it on top of the furnace, and left it there. The other one, I quenched in water, so I cooled it really, really rapidly. Okay? What that does is it distorts this unit cell structure that we looked at before. So this is what it normally looks like. But if we quench it, it gets stretched because these carbon atoms get stuck in the lattice. So when it's stretched, it's more strained and it's more likely to be what we call brittle. Okay, so we've changed the structure via processing to get a different mechanical property. Cool. Moving on to ceramics. Here's a bowl. Ceramics have this kind of similar structure as metals. So they have what's called crystals instead of unicells. So they're a little bit more complex than a metal. And the bonding that's between the atoms is quite strong. So bowls should be strong. Okay? I can stand on it. I could probably get a few more of you to join me up here. But it's a bit hard to balance. But if I drop this bowl, hopefully I didn't give anyone a heart attack, we know that it probably wouldn't survive the fall. Okay? So we can say that ceramics are strong, but they are very, very brittle, so they're not tough. Okay? So they behave differently to metals. So they're strong, but not tough. So they're kind of reacted like that strained steel. And finally, polymers. So polymers are long chains of carbon atoms. <coughs> We can represent with a wiggly line. And when a whole bunch of these wiggly lines interact with each other, we get a polymer. So this kind of makes it a nice interactive structure. They're all kind of bunched up on each other and tangled around. So as we heat the polymer up, what happens is these chains start to wiggle around and they move, and we can deform the polymer. So that's why recycling of plastics is really, really easy. We just have to heat them up a little bit, and we can change their shape. And similarly, if their structure is different, their properties are different. So if we have nice ordered arrangement of these chains, we get what's called a crystalline or semi-crystalline polymer. And these are opaque, so light doesn't pass through. If they have this random amorphous arrangement, light can pass through. So things like drink bottles have an amorphous structure. So you guys are all experts on material science now. Um, materials evolve over the years. So as materials engineers, we can take these materials and we can change their structure. We can make small tweaks. We can improve their mechanical properties. So by creating new materials, we enable new technologies. So when high purity silicon was introduced, that enabled the development of a transistor, which led to modern computing. But again, the other way around, we have new applications which drives the need for new materials. So during the space race, we had to develop new lightweight composite materials so that we could send them up to space cheaper because, you know, they weigh less, but they still hold the same forces and they still have the same mechanical properties as something that would be heavier. So one of the things that uh, materials engineers do in the real world is they help select materials for certain applications. So someone will come to a materials engineer and say, I'm designing this, what materials should I use? But it's a lot easier to think of it in terms of choosing a product, like a car. So if you're choosing to buy a new car, you might have some certain desired features, which you could split into constraints and objectives. So say, for example, we're choosing a mid-sized family car, four doors, we want it to run on petrol, 150 horsepower. Those are constraints. And then when we kind of have uh, a, a bunch of cars to choose from, we might want to rank them in order of which one has the lowest running cost. So that is an objective that we want to uh, minimize. So then we take our constraints and objectives, we put them through a selection engine, trade me, something like that, and we screen out the Ferrari and the motorcycle. They don't have four doors. They're probably not a mid-sized family car. Uh, and then we rank the remaining choices based on their running cost. But then, of course, we don't just buy the one with the lowest running cost. We seek documentation. We do Google. We look at all the reviews that people have ever owned that car. Is it a good car? Then we make our final choice, right? So choosing a material for an application is very, very similar. 
So say we wanted to choose a material for a visor on a motorcycle helmet. Okay? We have certain constraints and objectives. Does anyone know what one constraint would be for a visor? Transparent. Transparent. Good. We need to see where we're going. So transparent is one good constraint. Uh, we also need to be able to mold it. It's got a pretty complex shape. And as it's being used in a helmet, toughness is good. We don't want it to break as soon as something hits it. Okay? So we can put these same design requirements through a selection engine and kind of eliminate all the non-transparent metal, uh, materials, so metals can just go away. Um, and then we can rank the remaining ones by which ones are tough. So glass is transparent, but you wouldn't make a motorcycle visor out of glass. And then similar to the car, we wouldn't just choose the one that's as tough as possible. We would read about it. Is it used for the same thing? Is it used for similar applications? How much does it cost? Maybe there are other factors we need to think about as well. And then we can make our final selection. So this degree is called chemical and materials engineering for the specialization. So this is the materials side of things. So just how much materials is there in this degree? So in your first year, you get a general view of all the specializations. And in second year, we have uh, a one materials paper. And I managed to sneak some material selection, like we just did, uh, into this process design paper. In third year, there's another general materials paper that everyone takes, and we get our first elective slot. So electives are fun uh, papers that you get to choose. You get to choose your specialization within your specialization. So we have two there in second semester, which is materials performance enhancement, how can we make materials better, um, and materials for energy and environmental applications. And then in fourth year, two more elective choices, so the ones in the second semester are the same. But in semester one, we now get access to advanced materials characterization. So that was one of my favorite courses. We get to play with the scanning electron microscope, uh, transmission electron microscope, uh, XPS, uh, nano indentation. So you get to play with all these fun toys in order to characterize materials. So we have these properties like strength and toughness, but what do they actually mean? How can we characterize them? And then biomaterials and applications, this is one that I teach. Uh, so this is all about materials that we're going to be putting in the body. Okay? So they have to have very specific requirements for that application. So that's all I have for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find more about uh, Kemet, uh, we're in the corner overlooking the crossroads on uh, level four. If you haven't got it already, we have candy floss and popcorn. Um, and we have a fun game for you to play uh, where you can match the materials to the application. So do a little bit of material selection of your own. And you can go in the draw to win one of three KiwiCo subscription boxes. Thank you very much.